Good morning, church. It's wonderful to see all of you. Happy Father's Day. If you would uh, please stand. We're going to begin worshiping our Heavenly Father together.
good morning, everyone. It's a joy to worship with you. And again, happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. We thank you for all you do to lead your families and to lead this church well. If you would please welcome one another here today. I'd love to continue today, this morning, in worship uh, with a reading uh, from Colossians 1. And in this text, Paul uses this word to describe the appearing of Christ as uh, a mystery. He says it's a mystery revealed uh, by God to his people, that in God's infinite wisdom, uh, though uh, for generations the Israelites were not fully aware of, of God's plans, of God's ordaining, of his wisdom, um, it was made manifest fully in the arrival and the death and the resurrection of Christ. And this is what he says. Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you to the Colossians. And I fill up in my flesh what is lacking still in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church. And I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. That the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, our good Father has ordained that a mystery is revealed to us, the arrival of himself in the form of the flesh, Jesus the Son, to be crucified, to be raised to life, and in his resurrection we would have it too. So we're going to sing a new song today, rejoicing in this wondrous mystery and its revelation to us. Let's sing.
is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when all bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. Every prayer we pray in desperation. The songs of faith we sing through doubt. was not a one-time thing, Lord. This is every day, every moment, every time, every breath we take and step we take, Lord. It's in pursuit of the day in which we will kneel before you and glorify you, resurrected. Glorious King, Lord Jesus. Lord, we do behold your wondrous mystery, the revelation of God. We thank you, we bless you, and it's in your mighty name today, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare for communion. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I was asked to do the communion meditation this morning, and I don't know why uh, it happened to be, but uh, I am the oldest elder, so I guess I've been a father for almost 55 years now, so uh, sometimes I'm called the old dude, but today I guess I'm the old dad, so... Anyway, <clears throat> I'm, uh, when uh, preparing for this, I uh, came across uh, 
devotional that was six characteristics of godly fathers. And I know whenever I became a dad almost 55 years ago, I made a lot of mistakes. And I wish that I'd have had an owner's manual. I wish they'd have sent, you know, that little girl home with a book of instructions to how to take care of her, how to help her mother. But I made, I made a lot of mistakes. But then I got to thinking, you know, God has given us the best owner's manual, the best book of instructions that we could ever get. And it's right here in the Bible. And I've uh, looked up the six characteristics of godly fathers. And you know, our heavenly father meets every need that we have. He's a perfect father. He provides for our needs and uh, guides us along life's journeys and never forsakes us or leaves us. So here, here are uh, the characteristics that I found. Number one, godly fathers love their family. In Ephesians 5:25. Paul wrote that husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So, husbands, love your wives. Let your children see you love, love your wife. And also, you know, that will transfer fur over to uh, the young men. Whenever they get married, they'll know how to love their wives. So be an example to them. Secondly, godly fathers lead their family. And in Joshua 24, 15, he makes the statement, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So that's the thing that we should do as godly fathers. We should provide spiritual leadership in the home. So take time with your family to read the Bible and to pray. Number three, God provides for their family. Godly fathers provide for their family. Just as God has provided for all of our needs according to his riches in the glory of Christ, we too should provide for physical, spiritual, and emotional needs of our families. And, and that's, that's a goal that we should strive for every day. Godly fathers impart wisdom. We know that God's holy, inspired, inerrant word, word is the ultimate source of wisdom and truth. Deuteronomy 6 instructs us to rise up, sit at home, travel down the road, and lie down all with the attitude of imparting God's wisdom to our family. Number five, godly fathers provide correction. Hebrews 12 reminds us that God always disciplines out of love, and we must strive to do the same with our children. Paul also encouraged fathers not to provoke or antagonize our children to anger, but to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It comes from Ephesians 6.4. And godly fathers demonstrate forgiveness. Dee will go into this farther in, in, in his sermon, but in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, after the son, the son returns home, having squandered much of his father's wealth, and the father runs to him and embraces him, forgives him, restores him, and gives him his right place back in the family. What a beautiful picture of what God does for us. May we strive to model the picture of forgiveness within our families. But per perhaps you didn't have a family that was so godly, but maybe your father wasn't such a godly person. Maybe he, uh, he failed in areas, but uh, anyway, you can still have a restored relationship with him, or you can have a restored relationship with other members of your family. And perhaps your uh, earthly father has passed on, and you're missing him right now, and uh, you really, really uh, are mourning his absence. But God has the ability to uh, forgive, to restore broken relationships, and gives us another opportunity to do the right thing. So as we come to this time of communion, let's just reflect on what our Heavenly Father has done for us. Um, I said probably the most... Um, way that we can the best way we can relate to what how God looks at us is whenever we look at our children and especially at our grandchildren that you know that God loves us so much because we we love them so much but he even loves us more so on the night that uh, Jesus was betrayed in the upper room at the last supper it states in Matthew 26 verse 26 while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, 
Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So let's prepare to take communion now. So we prepare the wafer to, take, to get it together. Jesus' broken body for us, and also the cup. Jesus shed blood. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it seems uh, just not enough to say thank you, but we do thank you for your sacrificing your son, sending him in our place to hang on that cross. And Father, um, we reflect on that daily. We thank you so much for your love and uh, the love that uh, you have uh, not only shown us through Jesus Christ, but his, his death on that cross, but Father, you, you made a plan. You have a plan that, that uh, if we but follow him, accept him as our Savior, we too can have that assurance of overcoming death, of um, just that hope that we can live with you forever. And Father, we just pray that we uh, remember that daily. We uh, follow him daily, and uh, we just re reflect on how much you loved us that you would sacrifice your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Life is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. Uh, uh, I, I can't open this jar. See if mom can open it. Just take your time in there, okay? No means maybe. Hey, why don't you bring that ball inside and play with it? Hey, don't put that back where you found it. Just leave it on the floor. Ew, bacon. If you put a dent in the car, it's really no big deal. It's 10 a.m. Go back to bed. Look, whatever your friends are doing, just do the exact same thing. I got more than enough sleep last night. If your friends are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Stop signs are just a suggestion. You don't need a chaperone. You don't need a seatbelt. You don't need a savings account. You should buy the jeans with the holes in them. Hey, we're all gonna go to church, but you can just sleep in, okay? Can we please just hang out in here for another 10 minutes? Hey, can we get some more bickering back there? All right, bills. Yay, traffic. Woohoo, taxes. Yes, laundry. Hey, can you kids come in here and jump on my bed? Quick, go tell mom what happened right away. You don't need to finish your dinner. Hey, look at your phone when I'm talking to you. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason, texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please, mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna bungee jump out of this tree. That's a really good idea. Happy Father's Day. I don't know about you, but I never heard my dad ever say any one of those things. He never said that at all. And as far as I can remember, I never said any, things, any of those things to my kids either. But dads, you and I both know that we have done a pretty good job at times of putting our foot in our mouth. I mean, we say the wrong thing at the wrong time. I read about a, a young married couple, and this was the first time the, the bride had made cinnamon rolls for her husband. So she made one and set it in front of him. He didn't say anything for a while. And finally, she breaks the silence by saying, honey, if I sold these commercially, how much do you think I would get for one? And he looked up and said, about 10 years. But we do take it on the chin ourselves. I mean, there are times that, that, that we have to be on the receiving end of some of the bad things. A, a man and wife are walking down the street, and, and uh, all of a sudden the man stops and says, Honey, that lovely girl that just passed us, she looked at me and smiled. And the wife said, Well, I'm not a bit surprised about that. The first time I saw you, I laughed out loud. <laughs> We just don't get any respect, do we, guys? I mean, there are times that fatherhood, you almost feel like fatherhood is becoming somewhat obsolete or, or maybe that, that we're just not needed anymore. Maybe that uh, uh, we're, we're outdated, whatever word you want to use for that. 
But if you feel that way, you're, you're not alone. A couple of years ago in the American Association of Retired Persons magazine, which we now get, <laughs> uh, Ray Paprocki wrote an article called, Who Needs Dad? And he, and he said, as a guy, it's hard not to feel defensive these days. More and more American men are, are getting the message that they're dispensable. Uh, two years ago, and again, this was written a couple of years back, but two years ago, for the first time, women held more than half of the American jobs, and the recession proved especially hard for fields dominated by, by men, especially in manufacturing and high finance. One new book calls women the richer sex, another proclaims the end of men. Things are shaky on the home front, too. Single motherhood has become increasingly common. More than half of the births in the U.S. go to women younger than 30, and that occurs outside of marriage. A well-publicized report in the Journal of, family, of Marriage and Family even suggested that a child with two moms gets better parenting on the average than a child with a mom and a dad. That has been proven wrong, by the way. It can leave a father wondering, what is my role? Am I obsolete? Well, Dad, you're not obsolete, but you might be endangered. We feel that way at times. But the Bible makes it very clear that, Dad, you are neither obsolete nor dispensable. You are indispensable. It is, it is the role of every Christian father, not the preachers, not the elders, not the Sunday school teachers, not the youth ministers. It is the role, the primary role of every Christian father to bring to and to lead from a Christian perspective in the home. This is our job. This is what we've been called to do. We've been commissioned by the Father, the Heavenly Father, to do this. In most every wedding that I officiate, I always ask in the vows of the men, uh, men or, or whoever it is, uh, do you vow to be the spiritual leader in our home? And I, I want that to be spoken. I want that to be understood. We talk about that in counseling. What does it mean to be the spiritual leader in our home? That is a job that we cannot abdicate to anyone else. That is one of the primary functions of the dad. And, and unfortunately, I think we have, we're living in a time when that job has been abdicated to so many others, and we're not taking that seriously. I know Father's Day is one of those days men hate to come to church. They're going to be here to think, I'm going to get my feet stomped on. They're going to hammer me. I'm a lousy dad. I know that. I'm giving you guys a break today. Uh, we're not going to talk bad about dads. What we are going to talk about is the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. In that, we see this picture of the perfect father. God is the perfect father, is the heavenly father. But we also see that then pictured in the father of the prodigal son. And the same characteristics that are in our heavenly father, we see in this earthly father as well. But what we also see is that this son, and today, son and daughters are given an opportunity to make or break dad. And we can either by the things that we choose to do, the things that we say, we can make dad great, or we can break his heart. We can bring great joy to our father, or we can cause them great grief by what we do. So children, grandchildren, all of us who, who are the products of our dads, we have an opportunity to, to encourage our dads this morning. And, and like Ron said, I know, and you know, that not every family has at the helm a Christian father. I realize that. And, and, and so many of you wish that you'd had that when you were growing up. However, and Ron said so well, we can right now at this point commit to being the kind of godly father that God wants us to be. And so even if you didn't have that as an example... You can still, from the Word of God itself and from others around you who are leading those lives, you can find examples all over the place of men who love Jesus and who lead from that perspective. So I pray that we make the commitment to do that today. But to begin with, I want to look at three ways that we can make our dads unhappy. What can we do to bring grief to our fathers? This is not a lesson you go home and do. This is a warning that we have. So the first thing that we, that we can do to make dad unhappy is to withdraw from his love. Let's go to the story in Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal son. And we pick up with verse 11. Luke writes, The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Now we'll stop right there. You see... Uh, tradition, history is that when dad died, the estate was divided up, the lion's share went to the firstborn, and then it was given to the other children down the line. But here's the son that said, no, I, I don't want to wait. I want my share of the inheritance today. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. Now, everybody needs to leave home at some time. That's, that's a good idea. We need to do that. The Bible says a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. 
But the son or the daughter, who may be 30 or 40 years old, still living at home with mom and dad, may not be the best idea. And that may mean that someplace along the line that we're not doing a very good job as parents. I know there are extenuating circumstances that sometimes that does happen. But for the most part, if a son or daughter is still living at home at 40 years old, then, then there may be something wrong with that. Parents ought not to be proud of a child that's, that's not able to cut the apron strings. It may indicate a job's not being very well done. A young man asked a young girl to marry him, and she said, I can't marry you. You don't have a job. Where are we going to live? And he said, well, we can live with your mom and dad. And she said, we can't do that. They're living with their mom and dad, so we can't move in with them yet. One person said, the best teacher makes himself progressively unnecessary. Parents, we have a job of making ourselves progressively unnecessary, not, not disrespected, not unloved, not pushed away, but the fact that we are able to, through the years, step back and back and back and allow our children to become more and more independent, making decisions and living life on their own. That's, that's what we need to do. We need to release them and not parent by helicopter. Now, you may think that the prodigal son's father made a mistake in letting the son go, but but the son was of age to do this, and, and the father did all that he could. The son simply, simply was not mature enough to handle life on his own. But what really broke the father's heart wasn't just the fact that the son got up and left, but it's how he left. It was the attitude that was in the son when he left. He could not get away and get as far away as he could. This was crude. This was cruel. This was uncaring. This was unloving. This was thoughtless. He said, Dad, I am tired of waiting for you to die. I want my inheritance now. Give it to me right now. I want to get out of here. I want it. He didn't care how it made his father feel. He wanted out and he rejected his dad's love. Kids, you want to make your dad miserable? Show him you don't care about his love. That you don't want to be around him. Pull away when he puts his arms around you. Reject his advice. Say, Dad, get off of my back. When you're with your friends or you're in a crowd, make sure that you put your dad as far away from you as you possibly can. Don't associate with him at all. If you're having an argument with your dad, tell him that he's stupid and that you hate him and he doesn't know what's going on. You see, as we grow up, we go through three phases of life. First, there is dependence, and then there is independence, and then there's interdependence. As a child grows up, that child is dependent upon mom and dad. They need mom and dad to feed them, clothe them, take care of them, provide security. That's the job of parents. When they get into the later years, teenage years especially, they become at least what they believe to be independent. And again, we want our children to become independent. But when we get older and we become mature adults, we realize that we are interdependent. We have other people that we need in our life as well. Unfortunately, the son of the prodigal son believed that he was independent. He was in that middle stage, and he thought that he could handle life on his own. And he brought a great deal of grief to his father because of that. It broke his dad's heart. The second way that we can break dad's heart is to waste his resources, waste his money. In verse 13, it says that he moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money. It is not an unusual thing for the second generation who inherit the wealth of their parents not to handle that very well at times. One of two things happen when someone inherits a lot of money. Either they become very tight-fisted and they're very, they're very cheap with that, or else they become very generous and even loose and careless with the money and they blow it all. It's a rare thing, really, to find a second generation wealthy individual who's got a good balance between generosity and an appreciation for the things that have been given to them. You can make a good dad miserable by having the wrong attitude toward material things. Dads, I know that you love to give things to your kids. Who doesn't? I mean, you like to see the smile on the face of your son or daughter when you give them something. When Deb and I would go see Deanne when she was living in the home, the Silla home down in Anna, we would come in. We would stop at McDonald's or someplace and get her soda. And, and Deb, Deb... Debbie would bring it in and set it in front of Deanne and take the paper off the straw and put it in. And Deanne would look up and say, thank you, Dad. <laughs> I would secretly tell her to say that every time. No, she didn't do that. But when we give our children too much too early, they can become greedy or materialistic. The father gave his son on his 16th birthday a used car. The son was not appreciative. He said, I wouldn't be caught dead driving that piece of junk. So he turned around and sold it, used the money to buy himself a sports car that he wanted, and his parents let him do so. 
Proverbs 15 says, greed brings grief to the whole family. Now, I have heard dads say, uh, and I know that I thought this as well, I don't want my children, I, I want my, my kids growing up having a better life than I did. And not that I had a bad life growing up, but we think, yeah, we'd like for our kids not to have to struggle as much and not have to go through as many things as we went to. But again, giving them too much too soon can make a child unappreciative, can make them greedy. James Dobson, who has been known in the uh, parenting uh, circle, Christian circle for years and years and years and has written several great books, said, we are so concerned about giving children what we didn't have growing up that we neglected giving them what we did have. Maybe we didn't have a lot of material things that we, could, that we had as children, but we had an appreciation for the value of things, and we understood that there was a willingness to work for those. Those are the characteristics that we really need to be passing down to our children. An article that spoke about living in the age of affluence said that we need to help our, we need to help our children learn a proper appreciation for things. In other words, they said we need to give a progressive financial responsibility. How do you do that? How do you give a progressive financial responsibility? Well, you begin early, and you maybe do that in the form of an allowance. You give your children an allowance and, and make them responsible for that. There are rare occasions when maybe they might need more than that, but you very seldom ever do that and stick with that allowance. And, and as they grow older, you start giving them more. Maybe you start out with a 10-year-old and giving them an allowance of $5 a week. It tells you how old I am. I think that's a lot of money. Uh, they probably get more than that today. When they're 15 years old, maybe they get $50 or $60 a month or whatever it is. If they run out of money, and they use that money then for entertainment, going out, doing all those kind of things. If they run out of money at the end of the month or before the month is over, they don't get any more. You learn the value of a dollar. Learn what it is to budget. It works really, really well. This is how Debbie deals with me. I get a budget and I get, I get my money. There's a third way that we can make dads miserable. And I think this is really important that we end up, again, from the perspective of a Christian dad, that we violate his moral values. In verse 13, uh, Jesus tells us that he wasted all his money in wild living. And the young man knew that. When he came back home, he said, Father, I have sinned. I have, I have violated your trust. Every Christian father, I believe, wants their children to grow up to live godly lives, to accept Jesus, to live honestly, to be sexually pure, to refrain from drugs and alcohol, to marry a believer, to be faithful. That's, that's the dream, I, I think, of most parents. Uh, when Deb and I saw our oldest daughter, Joy, growing up and knew that she was going to be heading into that life one day, our prayer was simply this, Lord, give her a husband who loves Jesus and loves her. And, and God was gracious and, and granted that request and gave her that type of man. And, and if my children grow up, if your kids grow up, and they remain faithful to Jesus, and they marry a believer, and they have a strong Christian home, then no matter what other failures are part of your life as a father, you've succeeded as a parent. Yeah, there may be a lot of other things we've messed up, but if our kids grow up and they love Jesus, and they've brought that into their home and their family, and their family reflects the values of God, you've succeeded as a father, you've succeeded as a mother, you've succeeded as a parent. That's what we've been called to do. The world doesn't agree with this. The world says every child should be free to decide, to choose their own, his or her own standards. Don't impose your Christian values on your kids. Let them choose them for themselves. That's so outdated to try to make them to be believers. But a Christian father has been commissioned to train children to know Jesus, to respect godly values, regardless of what this world teaches. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 does not say, Fathers, bring up your children with the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord, but only if 55% of the population agrees. That's not what it says. And we don't do this to glorify ourselves. We don't do this to, to bring self-edification. We do it for the sake of our children, for for the sake of Jesus Christ, for eternity's sake, eternity's sake. Still, it's heartbreaking when a father sees their children walking away from truth, willfully disobeying God. And we ask the questions, where did I go wrong? What could I have done differently? Maybe nothing. You might have done all the right things. Unfortunately, even for Christian parents, there is no stone-clad guarantee that if you do all the right things, the kids will turn out well. We've all been given the ability to choose to make choices. Still, it breaks our hearts. King David may be a good example of this. 
David's son Absalom completely violated his father's wishes and principles, partly because he saw his father being unfaithful in his own life, taking Bathsheba as his wife, and, he, and Absalom lost, lost respect for his dad. Later, Absalom murdered his brother. He um, uh, fought against David, led a rebellion. He, he took Jerusalem for a small amount of time, even slept with some of his father's wives. Absalom's soldiers cornered Uh, or David's soldiers cornered Absalom and killed him. And when they came back and told David, they thought David would be glad. David wasn't. He stumbled up the steps of the palace and he said this, "Oh Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God I had died and not you. Oh, Absalom, my son. Proverbs 17 said, It is painful to be the parent of a fool. There is no joy for the father of the rebel. Boy, you want to break your dad's heart, a Christian dad's heart? then violate those those laws, violate those suggestions, violate those instructions regarding living under Christ. Violate those, and it brings brings a heartache. But not only does it bring a heartache to an earthly father, but it also breaks the heart of a heavenly father. We break God's heart when we withdraw from his love. We break God's heart when we waste resources. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, yet we waste food and we pollute rivers and we destroy the forest. We do these things. And when we reject God's moral values, when we violate the Ten Commandments because we say they're not valid anymore, they're outdated, the heart of God is crushed. Are there so many ways that that we can bring such grief and sorrow to our dads? But that's not the end of the story. The story shows us also a way that we can bring great joy, happiness, uh, celebration to the hearts of our fathers. So how do we do that? Well, there are four ways this son did this and four ways we can do the same thing. First of all, we see that we need to restore any broken relationships. It says in the scripture that the young man went to a distant land there. He squandered all that he had. He takes a job feeding pigs. And it says, I I love the scripture, it says that he finally came to his senses. He He was in his right mind. He said, man... My, ser- my dad's servants have it better than I did. Here I am feeding pigs. I'm going to go back. And I'm going to apologize. I'm going to tell dad that I really messed up. I- I- I've-, I've blown it. Please, just make me one of your servants and, and-, and see if that works. Cliff Barrow said that there are 12 words that hold family relationships together. I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And I love you. And men, there are three more. Let's eat out. Those are the other three. You see, the dad's heart was broken when his son rejected his love, but when the son came back loving his father, that heart was gladdened. It was restored. I love it whenever, uh, when I was a kid, and uh, after I got married, and, and Deb and I would come home, my older brothers would be there. We'd all come into the driveway, uh, and we'd park our cars. My sister and husband would be there, and, and Dad said, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to put a chain over the driveway. I'm going to sell every car in this driveway. It looks like a used car parking lot out here. Of course, he was kidding, and he loved having all the kids home. There was such joy in Dad's heart when all the family was there. We hear so much about quality time, and that's important. But there's also those things that happen that happen spontaneously, things that we don't think about, something we haven't planned. And God uses that to bring together the relationships of father and son, father and kids. When I was much younger at home, I always felt that Dad liked my three older brothers better. I, 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 think, I thought that he appreciated them more, that he, he, he doted on them more than he did on me. Of course, I think all kids do that or feel that way at some point. As I got older, I began to understand, no, Dad just appreciated us for our individuality and the uniqueness and the different talents that we had. And I remember after I, after I was married, I, I sat down and wrote a letter to Dad explaining to him how I felt as a kid. But how as I got older, I understood that I was wrong and, and how much I, I loved his support, his questions, his encouragement in my life. I found out after Dad had passed away, one of his friends came to me and said, you know that letter that you wrote to your dad years ago? And I vaguely remembered it. He said, he has that folded up, and that was in his billfold. And when he was talking with somebody about his kids, he would open up that billfold and bring that letter out. I said, let me read you this letter my son wrote. Those are the kind of things that, that help cement and glue together the relationships of father and son and daughter. It's not those planned things so much. It's the things that happen spontaneously. The times that we can just be with one another and encourage one another. 
The second way that you can bring delight to your dad is to respect his authority. You ever notice, notice the difference between the way the prodigal son left and how he came back? He left well-dressed, he came back in rags. He left clean and neat, came back filthy dirty, stinking like a pig. He, came, he left pure, he came back stained by sin. He left driving a Porsche and he came back in a Yugo. If you see anybody driving a Yugo, they're probably a prodigal son. I think that's probably true. But the, dig, the big difference here is that he left with arrogance. Dad, give me, give me what, I, what I deserve, what, I, what I'm owed. And he came back with humility. Dad, make me a hired hand. If you want to bring joy to your dad, show him that you respect him. And again, I know that it's not true that, that all dads have earned that respect. I know some of them have not. But as best you can, still show that respect in the best way that you can. Instead of arguing with dad when he asks you to do something, say, dad, I'll be glad to do that. Instead of ridiculing dad behind his back, stand up for him. Instead of making fun of dad when he tells you a dad joke, you know, laugh with him and, and compliment him on how funny that joke was, even though it wasn't. The Bible says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. If you, honor, if you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. This is the commandment with a promise, he says, and you'll live a long life on earth. Just because you obey your mom and dad doesn't mean you're going to live forever. But what, what Paul is saying here is that, that if you follow the spiritual and biblical directions of your dad, if that's what he's giving to you, if he's giving you these instructions based on God's word, if you live those out, then chances are you'll not be making risky decisions with your life that can bring harm to you. You will enjoy long life. You can live a long life because you're living a godly life, a life that brings glory to God. There's another way that you can delight your father. That's to have a positive spirit. You see, when the father saw his son broken, when he was submissive and coming home, it said that he ran out to meet him. This is the only time that we see God in a hurry. <laughs> He's running out to, to be a son. He, he's anxious to forgive his son. He races by the servants and he says, bring me a robe, bring me sandals, bring me a ring to put on his finger. He embraces his son. He smothers the son's speech that he had prepared in a hug. He said, kill the celebration calf. We're going to have a party. My son that was lost is now found. My son that was gone is now home. The oldest son, I don't want to celebrate. I want to pout. Kids, you want to bring, you want to bring joy to your dad? Have a positive spirit. There are times I have seen teens get together, and they have a great time, and they laugh, and they talk, and they do all these kind of great things, and the moment they walk in the door, man, they become sullen. They look like they've been weaned on a dill pickle. They hibernate in the room. There's one-word answers. They grumble and complain, I don't want to go on this boring vacation with my mom and dad. It's not going to be fun. You know what a real sign of maturity is? A real sign of maturity is to be with your parents and have a good time. Some time ago, I was looking back through some old photos we had, and Went back to 1991, Deb and I took a trip out to Washington, D.C., to Pennsylvania, wanted to see some of the history that was there. Didn't take Deanne. It was going to be a hard trip for her, but Joy went with us. And Joy was, uh, let's see, 91, and she was 11, 11 years old. And, uh, and she had a great time. She enjoyed the things she saw. But then I saw some other pictures as well, pictures of us in the house, and, and Joy brought her friends into the house. And she didn't mind mom and dad being there. As a matter of fact, she was glad mom and dad was there with her friends, and we, we talked and we played games and did things together. It, 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 th those were special times. They, they weren't big times, but they were times when there was real joy in the house because of a positive spirit. And, and I loved it so much that our daughter brought that home. Somebody was asking us last night about our daughter's name, Joy, and did she live up to that? I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, God was gracious, and, and the name fit the personality, or personality fit the name. There's another way that you can bring joy to your dad, and that's to love your siblings. If you're an only child, this will be hard. <laughs> the last part of the story tells about the prodigal son's brother. He resented the fact that the brother came home. He hears a celebration. What's going on? The servant says, hey, your brother that took off, you know, and left and took all the money and everything else. He's, he's come back home, and Dad's throwing him a party. We're all having a great time. Why don't you come and join us? He didn't want any part of that. He said, Dad, I've worked for years for you. I've slaved. I never asked anything of you. I've obeyed every command you've given me. And, and, and now this son of yours, 
that violated all of these principles and laws and rules. He's taken off and come back. Now you throw a big party and you don't do anything for me. I, I think that probably doused that celebratory spirit a little bit that dad had when the son came home. You know, I, I know there are times when we have sibling rivalry. That's normal for kids to, to kind of beat each other and we're kind of competing with one another. I read about a set of triplets. Man, they really got along well. They stood up for, they, they stood up for each other and, and, and they, they seldom ever fought each other at all. They just really got along really, really well together. But somebody asked the dad, said, well, yeah, how do you know which one to punish when none of the three will admit to it and they stand up for the other two? He said, oh, that's easy. I send all three to bed without supper. The one that comes out in the morning with a black eye gets punished. Pretty smart dad. You see, it's not unusual for siblings to fight. It's not unusual for them to argue and to carry on and fight. Man, I had three older brothers, and I think we, we fought like cats and dogs at times. Yet it's so interesting to see what happens when you grow up and you become a little bit more mature. I ride a motorcycle. My brother Tim rides a bike. My brother Jay had a bike restored. My oldest brother Gary got a bike here a few years ago, and if he hasn't wrecked it again, he still rides it. My dad rode a motorcycle at one time. It was actually my brother Jay's that he rode. But my brother Tim said to me, he said, wouldn't it be neat? Wouldn't it have been great if he and I and Gary and Jay and my dad could have all gone on a ride together, dad and sons? I said, yeah, that, that, would, that would have been awesome. That would have been neat. And we've talked among ourselves as brothers and, and said, I sure wish dad were here to see how the farm has, has grown, you know, they're farming 6,000 acres and they've got 60,000 pigs they take care of and, and all this stuff that goes on. And my oldest brother has gone through his ministry, he's retired and, and, and I'm about to be thrown, uh, I'm about, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Um, <laughs> we're doing ministry together and just all those things that, uh, that we've done in life, how I wish dad could have seen those, seen our kids, our grandkids. You can bring joy to any dad's heart by getting along as siblings, by getting along as a family. You see, these are the same things that bring joy to the Heavenly Father's heart. He wants us to seek Him. He, he wants us to be in His presence. He wants us to spend time with Him. Luke 15 says, There is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have never strayed. If you've run from God and you've gone to a far country, come home. Come back. God wants you back. He welcomes you back home. It brings great joy to God. We delight, we delight God when we respect his authority. The Bible says, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We bring joy to the Heavenly Father when we possess a positive spirit. When you come into worship and you come in with an attitude of celebration and praise, that's awesome. But if you come in with an attitude of criticism because you don't like this or you don't like that or you think something ought to be done here or, or whatever the case is, we break God's heart. The Bible says, come into the presence of God with thanksgiving and joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Have that attitude of joy with you all the time. God is never more pleased than when the body of Christ comes together to worship Him and acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior. God is pleased by that when we're in harmony. Abe Lincoln asked how he was going to treat the Southerners who pulled away from the Union. He said, I will treat them as though they never left. It's a good example. Even if you've pulled away from the love of the Father, from the love of God, if you come back, He will treat you as though you never left. This last week I had the privilege of being at camp it was a shorter week, went from Sunday to Wednesday, but it was a fun week. It was fin and feather week, and so we had kids out there that were learning archery and fishing, and we did classes in the morning and chapel in the evening and, and all the other times for spiritual learning. My job was to help with the fishing part, and so every day we would be out fishing along the bank. A lot of the kids were in uh, kayaks and canoes and fishing out in the water, so my job was to go and get the lures out of trees, um, get the lures off the back of the kids that had stuck their life vest in their back, uh, get, the, get the, the line out of the reels. They had reeled back inside of it. Little Jackson Chambers, he's out in the boat. D, D, come and help me. What's the matter, Jackson? He said, well, I've got my line wrapped around the rod. I don't know how. So how did you get it wrapped around it 18 times and that you got the lure in and out, in and in and out, in and out, in and out, every time it wrapped around? How did you do that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I got to be an expert at doing that. 
Yet there was such a, a, a sense, a sense of joy by being needed by these young men. A joy of serving. There was a, a joy of teaching, a joy of showing them how to do things. Say, yeah, come over here, this bank over here, this is the best place to go to fish right now. This is the time of day, this is where they're going to be. Yeah, this is, look, this is how, you, how you tie that, that cinch knot and, and tie that lure on there. This is how you put that swivel in place. Yeah, this, this is where you want to go to really get a, a good place to fish. And I love being able to share that with them. And the, and the kids going, okay, yeah, that sounds great. Ooh, that was a great catch. You did a really good job. It was fun. Families, you can, bring, you can bring joy to dad by restoring those broken relationships. You can bring joy to his heart by respecting the godly authority and the examples that he gives you. You can bring joy to him by having a, a, a positive spirit in the home and not one of dissension, not one of arguing, not one of conflict. You can bring joy to your dad by loving each other in the house. You can do that. And dad... You can bring joy to your family and joy to the Father by living under the guidance and loving his son, Jesus Christ. That's the appeal. That's the appeal to you today. That if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never accepted him as such, if, if you want to lead, if you want to lead your home from a godly perspective, you can start today with that. Again, you may be thinking, I don't know how to do any of these things in a Christian way. That's okay. We'll start today. Start learning today. But it, be, it means that you begin by saying, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, the risen Son of God, and I am surrendering my life to you and letting you be in control. If you need to make that choice, that decision today that will change the future of your life and that of your family, why not come and do that? Let's stand. Heavenly Father, it is a wonderful thing to be able to address you and call you Heavenly Father because you are the perfect Father. And dear Heavenly Father, from the perfection with which is, describes who you are, Father, we can, uh, we can attempt as best as we can, even in our fallen natures, to, to live that way as well. We know that we will, we will fail. As dads, we make mistakes. But there's always grace, and there's always forgiveness, there's always compassion, and so many times a second chance. Heavenly Father, live through us today. Speak to the heart of that dad out here today that, that needs to let go of this world and hold on to you and make a decision for eternity's sake, for his family's sake, and accept you today as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
today as we go out and walk as as fathers go out and walk as children go out and walk today that by the example of your faithfulness to us by the example of your child and his faithfulness to us may we be faithful to one another Lord may we be faithful to you it's in your glorious name we pray together amen uh, before we go, I'd just like to announce for, for the fathers in the room, we have uh, at the exits uh, flashlights. Uh, and you just grab one of those. And, and there's uh, an example uh, to demonstrate uh, the guiding light, uh, of your responsibility, uh, and, and the joy of the task ahead. So uh, if you would, you can grab one of those on your way out. But otherwise, have a wonderful day and have a great week.